pleased to have uh, Professor Sachs with us uh, today. She's, she's giving a, a Max Weber lecture um, later uh, this evening. And to interview, uh, there's myself, Richard Bellamy, the director of the Max Weber program. And I'm Jared Hawley, a Max Weber postdoctoral fellow in history here at the UI. So uh, we're going to ask a, a sort of questions more or less around your work on um, the morality of, of, of markets. Mm -hmm. And so my, my first question is a very general question, which is more or less, why should economists care about moral philosophy? I mean, perhaps the only time I've heard my uh, economics colleagues mention morality as being when they talk about moral hazard. Uh, uh, but that's a, a use of a peculiarly economic uh, kind. And, and in general, the, um, uh, the, 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 they would say the beauty of economics lies in markets being morally neutral between conceptions of good, even though they assume obviously a certain notion of, of the right of justice, but such as respect for contracts, property rights, um, but those could be regarded as internal to the working of the economy rather than necessarily constraints on mm -hmm. how it should operate. And indeed, some of what you say partly fits that picture when you talk about asymmetric information, mm -hmm. for example, which is something which interests. Mm -hmm economists from, from the efficiency side of things. But you've got more to say. Okay. Okay. And why yeah. should they care? Why sh so first I should say I have a pretty economics friendly um, approach to um, markets, unlike some of the uh, critics or some of the people interested in the moral limits of markets. I take a lot from, first of all, I, I think there's a lot of good things about markets. Um, but I do think that there are, are moral constraints on markets. Some of the constraints arise internal to uh, markets, like asymmetric information. You know, why care about asymmetric information? Or why care about um, externalities? What is an externality? So actually, economists can't avoid moral questions even if they want to because the very notion in economics of an externality really de you know which externalities do we care about um, if I don't like purple and you buy a purple shirt that's an externality you're, you're imposing a cost on me <laughs> I actually like purple yeah. but you know you're imposing a cost on me um, you know, which externalities do we regulate? We have to have some conception of that. Economists really operate with something like Mill's harm principle without acknowledging that they do. But once you begin to reflect on externalities or weak information, you see there are already some normative um, pieces inside the economic framework. And then markets, always rely on property rules. And property rules themselves are subject you know, to ethical evaluation. So whether economists do it or not, there's room for philosophers to come in and ask, are these the kind of underlying property rules we think are justified, optimal for you know, other values we have? So, I don't think it's escapable. And then even if the economist wants to say, I'm just doing the technical work, um, if that technical work issues in policy, policymakers have to think about the different normative um, trade-offs. And economists can help you identify some trade-offs, but they may also miss some trade-offs. Philosophers can help call attention to some of or moral philosophers to what trade-offs they might be missing. And then somebody, you know, people need to some way of thinking, how do I use these models? And to that extent, you can't escape um, normative considerations. But I do think even in the most 
um, value free. So, you know, if you think of not welfare economics, but just positive economics, even in positive ex economics, there are normative notions at work, like the notion of an externality, which has to have a normative component, or else you can't mm -hmm. wear your purple shirt. Yeah. Um, so, anyway, we need some moral guidance about. Um, mm. Uh, economic failures and economic limitations. Thanks. So I have a similarly uh -huh. um, general question, but from a different perspective. And it concerns broadly the relationship between history and your normative critique of economics or normative uh -huh. critique of contemporary egalitarianism. And so in The Morality of Markets, your book, you frame the intervention as one of historical recovery, at least in part. Uh -huh. And so I'd like to ask you to say a bit more about that. So. One approach to the question of the role of history in normative political theory would be to say that the history of political thought is primarily, if not only, a skeptical tool for critique. So this can helpfully elucidate conceptual impasses or normative shortcomings in contemporary theory. But another approach would be to draw more positively on the history of political thought and to look for more or less direct implications or applications to contemporary normative theory. And one of the reasons I liked your book so much is that it seems that you're doing a bit of both mm -hmm. of these things. That you use the history of philosophy as both a critical tool and as a source of ideas to be recovered directly. So I wonder if that's sort of a fair characterization of how you use the history of thought, and if not, just to invite you to say something a bit more about that. Okay, so I'm not a method, you know, I'm not, I'm, I should say, I'm not that methodologically reflective. I, you know, maybe no, that's a limitation of uh, the way I do philosophy. But it's, you know, I think you're given a good characterization, which is I am, you know, in, in my book, I'm looking at the history of economic thought, mm -hmm. partly as a way of thinking, how did we get here? Mm -hmm. And is there, was economics ever, you know, did, was it ever a moral science? And if it was, what changed and how did it change so that economists now think of themselves as doing technical work mm -hmm. that really is not evaluative in any way? And if you read the history of economic thought, you see there was a pretty rich notion of what a market was and what its role was, and you know, much more not a t as a technical notion, but as a part of a theory of mm -hmm. um, social equality in Adam Smith, mm -hmm. um, actually in Ricardo, in Marx, all of them are thinking about markets and their connection to issues about freedom and equality. Mm -hmm. So I think there's something to learn from this. Um, there's a question then about what happened and why it happened and whether or not it was, you know, we sort of made progress or whether we lost something. And, and then I actually think um, uh, two things. So one is we can learn from this history. We can also use some recent uh, insights in economics. So the you know contemporary economics in the last 15 or 20 years has really been rediscovering the kind of moral underpinnings of its you know so the idea of homo economicus is no longer quite as fashionable. Maybe this is since the 2008 crisis, but there's been much more empirical work looking at human altruism and its role, um, the, the way that Lots of literature now on the way that markets might undermine um, pro-social attitudes and the need to attend to that when you're thinking about policy implications. Mm -hmm. So it's both a recovery project, but it's also um, kind of bringing it into discuss, you know, into conversation with contemporary thinking, which is beginning to broaden out. Mm -hmm. And they're really, I think, there's room right now for. Uh, I think a major recovery within economics itself of mm -hmm. this moral tradition, mm -hmm. you know, partly coming out of this empirical work that people have been doing on human beings as a cooperative species, crowd, you know, the way economics can, you know, markets can crowd out social altruism, the importance of social altruism in human societies. Mm -hmm. So I think there is, and, and just much more, um, kind of uh, emphasis and recognition of market failure as a major piece mm 
of um, the you know the uh, economic framework and the reasons why most many markets many of the most important markets don't clear an equilibrium. Mm -hmm. So I think that you know ma there's major research going on now that actually resonates with this older tradition, even though the older tradition didn't have some of the technical tools that the contemporary economists have. Okay, great. Thank so. you very much for that. Um, so I appreciate that you're not that methodologically reflective, and I don't want to push you to be too much more. Um, so maybe I can ask a more specific question. So if we're, if you're reminding us, and I think it's very helpful to be reminded that economics used to be part of the moral philosophy uh -huh. tripos when it first uh -huh. emerged, I guess I want to ask then also about the politics of economics, as maybe distinct slightly from the moral limits of markets. And so if you're recovering a classical political economic mode of analysis, mm -hmm. where does the politics go? Where do we get a politics from our reading of, of this history that you're somewhat recovering and reminding us of at least? And for me, that seems somewhat striking given your position as a critic of liberal egalitarian philosophy. Mm -hmm. So I wonder if you could relate this role of history in the recovery to your role as an internal critic of that literature thinking of what you write in the moral of market, morality of markets on, say, Walzer uh, mm -hmm. and these kind of people. So w the reason I ask mm -hmm. is that there's been a lot of work amongst historians of political thought to highlight the emphasis on economic limits of modern politics by turning to people like Adam Smith that mm -hmm. you also return to. But one way of leveraging those insights has been to be wholly critical of the approach of normative theorizing of a morals first or an ethics first variety largely associated with roles. Mm -hmm. So whether or not the label is helpful, a self-subscribed realist political philosopher might draw on Smith to look at the place of equality and modern capitalism from the perspective of moral psychology or agency rather than moral intuitions. Mm -hmm. And another might draw on Marx to look at the concept of liberty from the perspective of power and production rather than circulation. And so how, I wonder, how would you differentiate your approach from the kinds of external criticisms advanced by a realist political theorist mm -hmm. looking at this history? Okay, so as I say, yep. I'm not, you know, there are people who are really sophisticated methodologists mm -hmm. and I'm more of a um, kind of practicing, um, you know, political philosopher that is interested in, you know, some substantive problem and approaches it and takes what tools seem to um, illuminate that project. That said, um, you know, I think it's very, I, I think it's very important that political philosophy be sensitive and um, importantly sensitive to empirical um, constraints and, uh, but philosophy isn't policy, you know, so I actually think there's sometimes um, a role for thinking through what the values are, what the trade-offs are, in, in part independent, you know, not letting your imagination be constrained mm -hmm. by the realist approach, but in the, you know, in the end, if you're trying to guide policy, of course you have to think about constraints. I just think that some of the literature that is, you know, if I'm thinking here of people like Raymond Goyce, that's more hostile to the, you know, Rawlsian theorizing, jump too fast mm -hmm. to the, you know, so-called realism. And I think we have to be, you know, we don't know, you know, social science, and I say this is not a social scientist, but has done a really bad job at um, predicting like the... Economists didn't predict the 2008 crash. The political scientists didn't predict the collapse of the Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. People didn't uh, predict the current election, you know, the last election mm -hmm. in the United States. We're not really good at understanding what the limits of the possible are, what the constraints are, what's going to happen. So I think there's a role for like having room for imagination mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, playing around with the parameters because we don't know exactly what's fixed and what isn't. On the other hand, if you're writing to try to guide policy, you have to think practically about how are you going to get, you know, how are you going to get from here to there, right? And it's certainly true that 
you know, Rawls or m most political uh, theorists don't have really good theories about transition. Or I mean, Rousseau no. has the, you know, the writer of the Constitution, you know, you mm -hmm. get the great the Constitution writer, or they don't have good theories. No. And we need to think about that. Mm -hmm. But there's still a role, again, I'm not a super, like, yeah. um, theory, but I think there's a role for not fixing the limits of the possible mm -hmm. too quickly, because we don't really know what they are. Um, and in some of the, so I write a, a fair amount on education. I'm very interested in issues about equity in education. There are some real practical constraints, particularly in the United States, on um, uh, how you're going to move a system that is you know, set off on one path. Uh, so we don't have a national education project. We have state by state projects. There's enormous inequality between states. In the United States, how do you address that? So you have to think about the practical constraints. On the other hand, you also have to think, you know, what are, you know, okay, what would be, what, to know what would be an improvement or to know what would be, uh, you, you know, you need some idea of where you're trying to go. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I don't want to be taken to be pushing you too hard to sort of bridge the theory practice mm -hmm. divide, but I do actually think that the work you do in the moral limits of markets is sort of a really interesting way of engaging both those elements. Uh, the empirical and the normative. Well, I'm That's trying really to be. Way. I'm trying yeah. to be an empirically informed, you know, political philosopher. Mm -hmm. That's how I think of myself. Is I'm empirically informed, but I want to say I'm not empirically limited. You know, so I'm. I'm uh, you know, again, if I, if I were going to try to place myself, you know, I really, you know, when Jerry Cohn said that, you know, philosophy is, you know, that the kind of philosophical principles have no, you know, they're, they're um, reality free. <laughs> um, I, that, I don't accept that, right? I'm, you know, I think we should be informed by empirical constraints and a theory that is good in the ideal but couldn't possibly ever be realized by human beings is not mm -hmm. a good theory because for political philosophy has mm -hmm. to be practical. So I don't take that approach, but I also worry that some of the realists are very quick to say, well, this is useless, mm -hmm. you know, um, it's all power, mm -hmm. um, you know, that's the only l language that we can speak is the language of power. I think the language of reason has a role to play. Absolutely, thank you. Oh, thanks, I, I very much agree with those sentiments. So, um, I mean, this is a more specific uh, point about uh, the accounts you give in, in, in the uh, book. So, if um, I've understood it correct, you, you have these four features which uh -huh. render markets uh, noxious. And um, they all relate in different ways to either how certain markets assume various forms of inequality mm -hmm. or how the markets might create various forms of, of uh, inequality. And so I've got sort of three points, mm -hmm. um, not, which, all of which I'm sure are familiar to you, but I thought. Mm -hmm were worth raising nonetheless. So, so the first, which is, in a way, you dig, uh, tackle in, in, in uh, the book, but uh, because it's such a, a common way of seeing it, I thought I'd raise it, which is, you know, some people would say, for markets to be fair, you've just got to assure a fair baseline. Mm -hmm. uh, because, you know, the feature, as I said earlier, of markets is, is their very neutrality, is, uh, and, uh, and their responsiveness to individual choice. So, first question is, you know, why you think that's in, inadequate of you? Um, second one is is why a fair baseline is exactly. Inadequate. So the second one is, uh, so you talk about. I mean, often when you're sort of comparing, uh, yeah. sort of uh, a noxious with a. With a non-noxious mm -hmm. market, mm -hmm. yeah, you, you refer to it as a non-noxious mm -hmm. market to to apples, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. and um, 
Among, and that makes it seem, although you know, you, you've also rolled back from this uh, in, in, in some ways, that your concern is with markets in certain goods mm -hmm. rather than certain types of trade, mm -hmm. as it were. But even certain types of trade in apples, I don't know where mm -hmm. there's mm -hmm. uh, a... Um, where there isn't enough, where fruit is too expensive mm -hmm. for poor people to, to, to buy healthy food mm -hmm. as opposed to unhealthy food. Uh, so the trade mm -hmm. could be, in a particular context, could be what one uh, mm -hmm. should be focusing on rather than the good. Mm -hmm. And then the third, which links up with uh, Jared's last uh, question, is that you know the type form of the quality that you you uh, adopt a relational form of equality, if that's right. It's often thought of as a, being a democratic mm -hmm. form of, of equality. And so, I mean, to one extent, isn't one correction to markets to democratise them mm -hmm. in various ways? In other words, that one ought perhaps to be more concerned with notions of... Uh, allowing labour to have greater power to organise through trade unions, possibly uh, having workers co-ops mm -hmm. so that they're working for themselves. Uh, and that, to what extent do you think that your argument points to a more radical critique of, of markets and their association with the distribution of economic power, uh, as, which we associate with capitalist forms? Mm -hmm. Great. Okay. That's a lot. Um, okay, so, um, okay, I'll go through them one by one. Um, so why not, why isn't just thinking about the background conditions sufficient? Mm -hmm. So, of course, you know, I have four parameters in my account of a noxious market, and two of them concern the background. Uh, one is, you know, what I sometimes call vulnerability mm -hmm. or, um, you know, uh, a very asymmetric bargaining positions. So that's a fairness constraint. The other is weak agency. That's not exactly a fairness constraint, but it's a economics friendly constraint mm -hmm. about information. So why isn't that the end of the story? The reason it's not the end of the story is that even w there are circumstances in which you can imagine even with fair background conditions and even with um, full information there might be some kinds of exchanges we don't want to enforce so and and because and I think an important point about my view is that markets are the concern of everybody not just the two transacting agents because they rely on background property rules and a state that enforces them. So when, you know, um, Robert Nozick in Anarchy State and Utopia says, in my utopia, you know, people would be able to sell themselves into slavery if that's what they want to do, he's not thinking about what would it mean then to enforce that contract if somebody changes their mind, right? That then implicates the will of all of us and I think that we have reasons from a democratic egalitarian point of view never to enforce that kind of contract, yeah. even if it were made under fair background conditions and with full agency. Yeah. So that's why I think, although I think the fair background conditions will get a lot, um, you know, in a lot of the markets we object to in the world, it's precisely because we think the transacting parties are. Um, some of the transacting parties are incredibly vulnerable. Even so, I think it's not the full story. That's why I have four parameters, not just two parameters, because I think some markets can have very bad outcomes, either for people themselves or for the social fabric of a democratic society. And that's why, again, I mean, to take another example that relates a bit to my lecture today, I mean, vote selling, now, one reason to object to vote selling is because you think in a world where votes were for sale, the rich would buy the votes for the poor. But even in a world where 
everybody has the same background, you know, let's say economic wealth. We have a lot, we have very strong democratic reasons not to allow people to buy and sell votes because it distorts the process of we together figuring out what's in our common interest, right? It counts some, let some people count for more than other people. We have reason to constrain that even in a fair background. So anyway, that's the answer for, I think fair baseline is important, but it's not the full story. Um, Second question was, um, sometimes it sounds as if I'm interested in goods and not in trades. So I think that is, you know, I may suggest that at times that would be a misreading of what I think, <laughs> because I don't think it's the, you know, I think some goods are more likely to um, uh, raise these kinds of concerns, but in my approach, unlike, let's say, that of um, Michael Sandel or Elizabeth Anderson and her earlier work, um, any good, on my theory, can become, uh, the trade in any good can become noxious. So I think, I, you know, if apples suddenly became poisonous, um, if there was enormous scarcity and that was the only food supply, then a market in apples could become noxious. Mm. So I, I don't mean to be thinking about the intrinsic nature of the good. At the same time, there are some goods that I think raise issues, and this relates in part to your third question. So I think labor markets are particularly um, special because unlike the classical case, the canonical case of an apple market, the buying and selling into an apple, I mean, this isn't totally true because there are environmental issues, but mm. you know, in general, doesn't affect the apple. You, know, you can sell it, and the conditions under which you sell it doesn't really affect it. The conditions under which you sell human labor has feedback effects on workers. And that makes labor a kind of special market that is going to tend to raise the kinds of concerns that I identify with noxiousness mm -hmm. that won't be true in general of an apple market. Even though in theory, an apple market can become noxious, it's less likely to become noxious than a labor market because for one thing, there's important feedback and that's another th reason to cons be concerned not just about the baseline, but that certain kinds of relationships that people enter into in the labor market can have a feedback effect on who they are, what their capacities are, what they're able to do, and that can have effects, first of all, on them, for them, but also on the possibility of democracy. And among the reasons to object to child labor um, obviously, the kind of most important one is what happens to the children who are, um, uh, you know, the subjects of those markets. Which, you know, again, they're they're not themselves the agents, and you know, the major thing is that um, they're not educated for the most part in when they go when they enter into child labor markets. But there's also a democratic effect. Which is a second reason, you know, when which is that you're creating a kind of worker who's not going to be educated enough about the world and um, and the scope of possibility and alternatives mm. um, in order to engage as a democratic citizen. And we know there's a, some very nice work on bonded labor markets um, that shows that employers who bond their workers, but also uh, may rely on um, uh, you know uh, uh, nor you know free labor isolate their bonded laborers because they don't want them to talk to workers who can enter in and out of contracts because they don't want them to have that kind of knowledge right. so there are democratic reasons to care about labor markets in a way that there aren't about apple markets and then you ask, your third question, well, doesn't this all point to the need to democratize the economy? <laughs> and I'm absolutely, yes, it wasn't really the project so much in this book. I'm writing a paper now that really is about um, kind of ethics and work and the workplace uh, with an economist. 
that is looking at arguments for democratizing workplaces. I mean, it's implicit in some of what I write in mm -hmm. the uh, markets book that um, you know democratic workplaces are really important as vehicles for democratic citizens. But I don't elaborate on that, and I don't really elaborate on the scope of the economy as a whole. Um, in one way, uh, you know, if I were going to write the book now, I would write it differently than I wrote it in 2010. So when I wrote it in 2010, even though I didn't quite mean this, I, I, partly because of the kind of work I had done, I focused on cases which I thought were very stark, but almost all the cases in the book involve the um, markets that, uh, that concern the body. So whether it's uh, prostitution or surrogacy or buying and selling human organs, they're, re and, and they're really about the body. And I actually think if I were doing it now, I would write more about health care and uh, labor markets. And I would, I mean, the approach, I would still take the same approach, but I would really frame it with different cases as the kind of core cases. And... I understand why I wrote it that way, and I think I end I end the book by saying, you know, this really should be applied to thinking about things like, um, mar you know, futures markets and um, you know sure. derivatives, and there's a lot of things I didn't uh, apply this to that uh, you know really should be the account should be extended. So, mm -hmm. can I just yeah. follow up on that because it, it really fits into my mm -hmm. my. Next time, the last question. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, because, I mean, in, in some ways you differentiate your argument from Michael Waltz's in Spheres of Justice, but uh, if I recall correctly, uh, he says, you know, uh, what led him to adopt the approach he did was reading uh, Bernard Williams' famous article on equality, mm -hmm. which has healthcare right, right. as its. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm as its case. And, and there, he isn't, as you, I mean, you criticize people who, who refer to uh, market zone being bad when it somehow is at variance with the intrinsic meaning mm -hmm. of the good. But in talking about healthcare, that mm -hmm. isn't what he is doing. There, he's talking about it precisely mm -hmm. as one of these public uh -huh. goods, a, a good which for, for various reasons uh, is, is something that, I mean, what renders it public in this particular sense is that it's something that all d democratic citizens should be equally mm -hmm. entitled to, and, and hence it shouldn't be marketized in the sense that a private market for healthcare mm -hmm. is one which, uh, unless it's operating only at the margins, but when it dominance mm -hmm. the scene as is the case in the United States, for example, mm -hmm. it, 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 it undermines access to it mm -hmm. as a public good mm -hmm. for, for, for all. So is that more where you're, is that where you're heading is, is what I'm asking and, and therefore mm -hmm. you know, maybe his approach is closer to yours than, than you give it credit for at that time. So, um, I, you know, I think implicit in some of Walzer's account, you could draw out some of my parameters, but now here we go to the methodology issue. Mm -hmm. You know, Walzer thinks that what he's doing is teasing out what he calls the social meaning. Mm -hmm. And I always thought Dworkin, who reviewed Spheres of sure. Justice on healthcare, had a good point. You know, at least in the United States, the social meaning of healthcare is completely up for grabs. Mm -hmm. Part of the population thinks it's a private good. Part of the population thinks it's a public good. So saying that the social meaning is that it's mm. a public good doesn't help us resolve the issue. Yeah. So I, you know, I reject the way he grounds the, um, sure. the case for public provision. But I think you know, when you actually look in his theory of you know, complex equality, you can pull out some of the parameters that I'm talking about. So it's not... Um, inconsistent with some of the arguments he gives, but the basis is very different. Mm. Um, and I've always thought, Walzer, you know, it kind of, you know, this is partly why I'm not a methodologist. I feel like he binds himself 
by the straitjacket of this methodology yes. for approaching these things. And then, you know, I think a lot of plausible um, points he makes fall by the wayside. I mean, he has a wonderful argument, you know, talking about um, workplace democracy. He has a mm. wonderful argument about workplace democracy. It doesn't have anything to do with social meanings, mm. right? It actually has to do with looking at the reason we accept political democracy and then asking whether or not the reasons that we accept political democracy carry over to the economic sphere, right? And so that's the, whatever, the story of JJ who founds a town, um, mm -hmm. and then he asks, does the fact that somebody created something or founded it give them ownership rights over it? And if we don't think it gives them ownership rights over a town, even though they built the town, then we shouldn't think they get, just by building a factory, they get ownership rights over the factory. So it's really a consistency, it's a kind of Rawlsian reflective mm -hmm. equilibrium. It's not a um, social meanings argument. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, when you actually read the, you know, Walzer's essays, I actually think they're pretty rich, but the methodology he adopts is not so rich. Mm -hmm. And I feel sometimes you know, as I say, it doesn't doesn't work sure. and leaves him. So I so, yes, you can give an argument for. Um, uh, I, I'll come out in the same place as Wolzer on healthcare as a public good, but I'll come out there for different reasons. Sure. Yeah. So I could ask perhaps one of two questions, or both, and you can answer whichever yeah. way you like. Um, but these concern more what you referred to before is your political imagination mm -hmm. and how you might imagine or view the means of correcting markets or protecting mm -hmm. public goods. And I'm specifically interested because I saw that in your lecture for tonight, mm -hmm. you cite people like Cole and Tawney mm -hmm. and the ethical socialists. Mm -hmm. So to go back to sort of someone like Smith and Rousseau, one reason why they, their projects famously failed Mm -hmm. They couldn't write the big book that they wanted to write, either of them. And one explanation for that is that they failed because they recognized the fundamental tension between the logic of commerce, or the market on mm -hmm. one hand, and the logic of politics on the other. Mm -hmm. So market exchange is necessarily international, politics yeah. is necessarily local. Mm -hmm. Now insofar as your theory provides a normative grounding for political regulation or intervention to, po to protect public goods, it's, one might think that it does assume, does it assume or presuppose a national state capable of making it? So this mm -hmm. is a debate specifically in terms of where should the British left go at the moment and how should <laughs> the British left approach the question of Brexit? Um, so I'll, I'll leave that at that. Um, but then because you invoke these uh -huh. British ethical socialists mm -hmm. like Tommy and Cole, who mm -hmm. definitely did presuppose and worked within conditions where this state was capable of making such an intervention, um, I wonder to what extent your theory um, is calling for us to view the national state in this way, um, or how you view the state and the international uh, dimension to politics and markets. Right. Mm -hmm. So great and um, you know hard, <laughs> hard quest, very hard question. So, you know, I am a you know relational or social egalitarian, and I definitely think. You know, the state is one, you know, kind of key site we have for that kind of egalitarianism. We don't yet have a way of realizing, you know, relational egalitarianism on a global scale. Um, so I am committed to the project of, you know, of course, some kind of integration like the EU, but uh, some, I'm not for... Um, dispensing with the national state. Mm -hmm. At the same time, you know, I think globalization is a good thing if it's carried out in the right way. Maybe it hasn't been fully carried out in the right way, but um, there's a lot of room within a globalizing world for egalitarian national projects. Uh, and we know there's a lot of you know room for variation because the United States looks very different than Norway does, even in the context of globalization. So you can't explain 
you know, the Gini coefficient of the developed world just by, you know, globalization or what's happening in the United States just by globalization. And globalization can be carried out um, in many different ways. So I don't accept, I think Danny Roderick ha um, has this trilemma, right? You can have globalization, the national state, you can't have all, you can't have democracy, national sovereignty and globalization at the same time. You can at most have two of the three. And I think he's probably wrong about that. Like I'm, I, or at least let's say I'm not, I haven't been convinced yet. So this is a like, don't be a realist too soon. Um, I'm not convinced you can't get all three. We've had globalization carried out really on, you know, on the terms of elites. We don't know what globalization would look like if it were carried out in a more egalitarian you know, way. But I think globalization is very important. I mean, the great, um, what Angus Deaton calls the great escape is uh, really like, you know, it's a development to be celebrated and globalization is part of that. I mean, markets are an important part of that and that's, um, you know, why I'm uh, not, as radical, I mean, I'm radical on democratizing the economy, but I'm not radical in the, we can get rid of markets. Um, so the kind of Jerry Cohn, again, to go back to Cohn, you know, the camping trip writ large, um, I don't think that's a good model. So Jerry Cohn thinks that the, you know, economy, you want the kind of relations you have on a camping trip where everybody does like their altruistic bit. Of course, I always worry on the camping trip it'd be the women who would be like doing all the cooking and the cleaning, and the guys would be, you know, that's what altruism can lead to. And so I don't think that's a realistic way of organizing an economy, and I think markets are really key to that story of the great escape. They're not the full story of it. Um, but I'm not, I, I definitely think we need to, this is something we need to figure out because. Um, national, you know, hardcore national sovereignty that tries to, you know, Brexit out of uh, the globalizing world is not a good solution. It, um, it leaves too many people out of development. It's uh, too narrow. Uh, on the other hand, globalization on the terms of the elites is also a problem. But I'm not convinced that Roderick is right that we can have some, you know, democracy, <laughs> national sovereignty, and globalization. And there is some empirical work that suggests this. Uh, Chuck Sable is the person I know who's been doing work on kind of complex forms of regulation that allow for what he calls equalization um, and harmony among distinct standards. So that's what Roderick is really worried about, is that you can't have complex standards like different languages or different norms, national norms, different ways of growing things. And, and um, uh, Chuck Sable tries to give us examples of new forms of regulation that allow for diversity, but where people certify equivalents. Mm -hmm. Anyway, that would be a way to get out of the trilemma. So uh, that's not really a full answer except to say I don't think I think the nations you know I don't think we have another game in town to completely get beyond the nation state maybe you know the EU is a nice model but even the EU is not the whole world um, I read uh, Philippe's uh, um, Max Faber lecture uh, you know on you know and I'm, I'm you know more with him on this than I am with Rawls on the EU uh, but I still think the nation state is, you know, an important site for egalitarian social policy. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Great. No, um, I don't think there is an answer that could be <laughs> given at the moment. Um, so maybe I could just, I don't think I have what amounts to a question about mm -hmm. this issue, but because you did bring up Cohen's camping trip, mm -hmm. <laughs> I wondered if you could say a bit more about the worry about the gender division of labor as you brought up there. And maybe I can just, rather than asking mm -hmm. a question, just to just tell you why I'm interested mm -hmm. in it. So one reason, so I'm interested, like you in recovering Smith and Marx and mm -hmm. this approach, I'm interested in recovering Rousseau. Mm -hmm. But one of the things that we can't recover from Rousseau 
is the fact that his egalitarian national project is grounded on a gender division of labor. Yeah. And so, but the, one of the things that we can recover from Rousseau is his attention to what you referred earlier to as the background conditions mm -hmm. of market agency. Mm -hmm. The way that he grounds those background conditions or wants to provide a sort of morality to politics and interpersonal relation, relations is through a very strong notion of the family and the way that households can provide for morality. So that's sort of where I'm coming from, and I'm just wondering if you could say a little bit more about that, the role of the family, perhaps, democratizing the family, households, or thinking about the morality of markets, not from above in the international, but from below in the family and the local. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, lots there. So, uh, you know, I was very influenced by my uh, colleague, now deceased, Susan Oaken, who wrote a lot about the family and the role of the family in the history of political thought, yeah. including in Rousseau. Yeah. And, um, you know, and I think the project of both democratizing the family and equalizing mm -hmm. the you know roles in the family is a very important project, and it actually gets back to, you know, I mean we don't know if uh, men and women really had equal baselines. We don't know what they would choose. We you know certainly hope that their choices would be more equal. Um, but there's a lot of socialization that has gone on that we have to kind of try to figure out how to, um, I don't want to say combat, but undo. <laughs> um, and, and so it's very, I worry a lot, so there are a lot of accounts, I, I mean, I'm, I'm a big fan of pro-social attitudes and the role of pro-social attitudes, mm -hmm. but I often worry about exploitation in the context of pro-social attitudes, so the way that people who are more altruistic than other people are vulnerable to exploitation, and I sometimes feel like the choice perspective can leave that out, because it will say, well, if you benefit from giving to people, you know, then what's the problem if other people like benefit from your altruism? So, in hypothetically that seems fine but when you start to notice that there are you know certain people who are the ones more likely to be the altruists and other people more likely to be those riding free on the labor of the altruists then you have to worry about what's going on here um, is there some systematic free riding on the labor of other people and that we know that happens in the family right so that um, Men have free, been free riders off a lot of the caring labor of women, and that's you know a, a, I think has to be a big concern. Um, there's another concern with markets and um, uh, and gender, which is all you know. It, this has changed, but it used to be the case in the development context where the family was assumed to be the unit. And in giving aid to families, the aid would often go to the head of household, mm -hmm. which was the man. And what they found is the men would sometimes spend the money on themselves, on drink. Um, but if you could target the women with the money, it would more likely go to the children. And so it's actually not only is it important to have you know fairness and no exploitation, but it's also important to not black box the family mm -hmm. and to look at what um, uh, goes on inside the family. I don't think I'll have time to bring up this example today, but I'll uh, raise it um, now. So in thinking about in-kind aid, I came across an interesting study by some economists at the London School of Economics that looked at um, donate, uh, giving, you could either give cash to women or bicycles. And the uh, women needed bicycles to get to uh, work, so to have some kind of independence. And so they were interested in, like, did it, you know, what happened? If you gave the cash, what did they, what did wind up using it for? And it turned out, the cash was almost always used to buy the bicycle. So you could give them the bicycle, or you could give them the cash. Looks like, well, you're increasing mm -hmm. their agency because they're making the choice. Then they went and interviewed the women. And it turned out 
almost all the women said, we, uh, who even the, the women who got the cash said, we, didn't, we would have preferred that you gave us the bicycle. And so the, they were surprised by that. And they said, why? And they said, because once we had the cash, our husbands tried to take it. Mm -hmm. And we had a fight for it. And if you'd just given us the bicycle, we wouldn't have had to have these battles with our... Anyway, and I thought, mm -hmm. oh, that's, you know, that was, that's pretty interesting. So again, you can't black box this stuff. You have to look at mm -hmm. what's going on inside the family. Yeah. Great. Thank you. I think we all agree. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much for...